Okay. Welcome to the um, Leventhal Math Center and uh, West Roxbury Branch um, Community Atlas Go History Night. Um, we're just chatting right now. Um, so if you're tuning in later, keep watching. We're going to start in about a minute. Um, I'm just talking to Kate here. <laughs> Hello. Kate, you're not you're not at the library though, are you? I'm not. I'm in my house. You can see the kitchen behind me. I think um, oh, yeah. I tried to turn off all the lights so that you can't really see anything. But yeah, that's <laughs> the kitchen <up> there. <laughs> yeah, if anybody, I think you can't see it right now, but my rabbit is like um, behind me, just nice. munching on some hay, having a great time. He nice. doesn't know what's going on over here. Yeah, um, my cat is not happy that I'm home all the time. He is, he hates me. <laughs> That's great. That's too bad. I feel like my rabbit likes that we're home or doesn't care, and I'm not sure which. Um, but he's okay. definitely not mad about it, which is the, just the best that you can hope for, really. Really? Yeah. So it's 7 o'clock, um, so we could probably start now. So um, let me take this banner down. So my name is Rachel Mead. Um, I'm the Public Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator at the Norman B. Leventhal Math and Education Center. And this is Kate, uh, which way do I put this is Kate? Um, who, you're the adult librarian at West Roxbury, right? I'm a generalist, yeah, at West Roxbury. Cool. Um, yeah. So we're just here to to welcome you all. Um, Kate, did you want to say anything or plug anything? Um, upcoming, the West Roxbury branch has a music Zoom presentation on December 1st. It's Howie Newman playing folk music. And you can register for that through the BPL webpage under events. You just look up Howie Newman, um, 7 p.m. December 1st. Uh, or you can email me, but my name is ridiculous to spell out. So emailing me takes some effort. So it would just be K and then my last name, which I think it shows everyone procession at bpl.org to get you that link. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> that sounds fun. Um, I, have, I have an event scheduled opposite you, so I don't know. I won't be able to be there, but hopefully some of our um, patrons will. Um, I hope so. <laughs> but thank you. Um, yeah. And thank you for having me here. Yeah, of course. Um, do you want to, should I, we should say goodbye to you for now. Do you want to come back at the end? You don't have to. Um, can I just stay for like the first few minutes and then probably peace out? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. All right. So uh, see you, Kate. Um, so I am going to add my PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about West Roxbury and this great tool that we have, um, Atlas Scope, for um, kind of examining local history in Boston. Um, but before we begin, I have another window that I want to go to. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge um, that we work on, we live in, and we're discussing unceded native territory. Um, the Chauvin Peninsula and the surrounding region is the ancestral and current home to indigenous peoples, including the Mashpee and Aquinnah Wampanoag tribes, Nipmuc nations, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Tonight, we're talking about land that we now call West Roxbury, which was a name given to it by white settlers in the 17th century. The land use maps we're about to discuss record this type of property ownership um, uh, that, that existed in the 19th and 20th centuries, but they don't address previous or contemporary native groups adequately. Often the late 19th and 20th century period is thought of as a time after colonization in New England, but colonialism is an ongoing process, both in the times that the maps were created and today. So these atlases of mostly uh, white Euro-American land possession were being produced really at the same time as massive violent efforts at let native land dispossession in other parts of the continent. So today, um, many native, many um, nations and bands are asking for recognition and land rights from federal, state, and local governments. 
Tonight, we recognize that the land we present from is occupied territory and recognize that the um, genocidal practices perpetrated in the name of that occupation. Um, many of the maps that we have at the Leventhal Map Center were created for this project of colonialism, expansion, erasure, and dispossession. However, Native people remain on this territory and are stewards of the land as they have been for hundreds of generations. If you're tuning in from out of town, then um, the groups that I mentioned may not apply to you. So you should definitely check out um, nativeland.ca. It's a really great digital mapping project to start or develop your thinking about the ways that cartographies of colonialism relate to your life and where you live. This is just an acknowledgement, um, but hopefully it becomes a seed for change in the ways that we interact both with land and the native people to whom it belongs. So definitely go to that website. Um, you can leave a note in the comments. Um, I'll put the URL in the comments there. Um, you can leave a note in the comments about whose land you're on um, that you're tuning in from. And that would be really great to hear uh, where people where people are watching from. Um, this is going to be an interactive presentation. So this is just the first time that I'm asking you to type something into the comments. I can see the comments um, and I'll try to respond to as many as I can throughout the night. Um, so just let me know if you have any questions and I'll try to get to them. Okay. Let me find my PowerPoint. Okay, so um, the urban atlases that I was just mentioning in the land acknowledgement are these really great tools for doing research, especially genealogical research and history research. Um, we have a lot of them at the MAP Center. I'm not sure off the top of my head how many, but um, over a hundred of them are digitized and in in our uh, system. Um, many of them are of Boston. We also have some of the surrounding uh, kind of inner suburbs and other surrounding towns. Um, most of them are fire insurance and property, um, like real estate atlases. So what they the information that they have is like very specific for um, what you would want in terms of um, property research. So they have information about what building material um, the buildings are made out of. So like the colors of the buildings correspond to different um, types of building materials. Um, they tell you if there is a, uh, a firewall. They tell you if there are windows and uh, sometimes even what level of the building the windows are on, which is helpful information if you're trying to insure a building against fire. Um, maybe not quite as helpful anymore if you're just looking up information about old buildings, but it still is like a really cool piece of information to have sometimes. You can confirm whether a building that you think is as old as, um, as you know, 19th, early um, 20th, late 19th century or older. Um, you can confirm whether it's as old as you think it is, maybe based on these like very detailed um, pieces of information about the building itself. Um, and then what I think most people find even more useful is just the property ownership information. So this is kind of what they'll look like. They show you the name of the people who own the building. I would say, uh, one of the weaknesses of these atlases is that they're so big. So that's really helpful because they're really detailed and beautiful. Um, but on the other hand, it's incredibly inconvenient to drag one of these books out onto the counter, um, open it up to the index, find what page you're supposed to look at, and then flip to that page. And then if you want to compare, um, like, one year to another year for the same location, you have to get another book off the shelf. Um, and since we're treating these very nicely, um, as, as all librarians do with our materials, this is a, a very time consuming and arduous process. But they can answer a lot of really important questions that you might have about the history of Boston, the history of your neighborhood, or the history of your house. Um, or a house where someone related to you lived or someone you're researching lived. 
So they have a lot of like very rich information that you very well might want to use. So what we've done is we've created um, something called Atlas Scope. Let me take down that banner. Um, we've created something called Atlas Scope, which is basically um, a digital transformation of all over 100 atlases surrounding, um, covering Boston and surrounding areas, 1861 through 1938. So a period of, you know, 80 years almost. And what our platform used to look like was like, you would search um, an atlas and then you would get every single page separately. Um, so basically the same way as paging through the actual book, you would have to go through and look at it each one individually. And what we've done is we basically digitally, not in real life, um, cut out around the plates and then glued them together, stitched them together so that you have this like map that that completely negates the any any reason for having an index. So you have the whole thing instead. Um, different areas of Boston have varying coverage. Downtown Boston has about two dozen atlases covering it, um, just because we have a lot of those. West Roxbury is covered by nine atlases at the moment, so from 1874 to 1924, which is a good 50-year spread. Um, so it's pretty useful. Um, you can head to atlascope.leventhalmath.org on your computer or on your phone. You can do this. Um, on any device, and I definitely recommend um, following along here in case you want to learn how to use it. Um, here, I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, so if you go to that link, um, there are a couple of options here. On the left here is Find Me, so you can actually walk around Boston using this tool, which I think is really cool. So you could like um, have it track your GPS, and as you move down like Commonwealth Ave, um, it will move with you. And, and it will tell you like in 1874 what the layout of the land was like, which is pretty cool. But most of the time, probably what you're going to do is search places, and if you're ever really just checking stuff out, you can always start a BPL on um, the third button here, and it'll plop you right down in um, Copley. But we're going to search places right now, and we're going to search for the library. So we're going to go to 1961 Center Street. Um, what you'll notice is that when you type in the address, um, this a bunch of options pop up. Sometimes there's like there are other center streets in the Boston area. As you can see, there's one in Brooklyn, one in Roxbury, obviously one in Jamaica Plain, one in Cambridge. Um, and this can get very confusing. Luckily, there's only one that has a 1961 address, but that's not always the case. If you were looking for like five center street, probably all of these center streets have one of those. So you have to make sure that you're clicking on the right one, just like in any search engine. Um, and then if you uh, hit enter, it'll take you right here. Usually it takes you to the oldest layer unless you're already browsing like within the same area. Um, so this took us to 1874, which is the oldest layer down here on the right. You can actually click that and drop up the list um, and then choose a different year to compare to. So you can choose 1924, which we're comparing here to a modern map. You don't have to compare to a modern map. You can actually also uh, drop up that one and compare it to one of the other layers or um, modern map or uh, modern aerial imagery, which I think is really cool because you get a good sense of the building footprints. Um, you can also, like before we were using the spyglass over here on the left, um, bottom left, you can also use a uh, Y swipe um, an X swipe or play with the opacity of it, which I think is really fun. Um, sometimes that's like the most helpful way to look at it. So it really just depends like on the area of Boston that you're looking at and what kind of image you wanna have. 
Um, I definitely recommend clicking about this map down here in the bottom right hand corner sometimes just to check it out. Um, what you'll see is the source information for the overlay map. So who, what the title is of the map, who published it, the year, um, where it's housed, um, or who owns it at the moment, which uh, is the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the BPL. Um, I will mention here, if the BPL owns something, that means that it's for you to use. So um, not only do we have this tool, but when we're in person again, you're definitely allowed to request to see these um, atlases in person, flip through them, and kind of compare the tactile um, sensations of using the atlas to using Atlascope. Um, I think you'll be surprised how similar they are actually. And here's, here's what one of those plates looks like. So this is actually the one that the library is on in 1924 that we were just looking at. It's down here in the left-hand corner. Oh, you can't see it because of my banner. Let me get rid of that. Um, where's my mouse? Okay, so yeah, so it's down here in the left-hand corner um, next to where it says Word 23. So I want everyone to try it out. Um, this is usually the part where there's going to be a long, awkward pause because um, everyone's going to um, go to atlascope.leventhalmap.org and find the name of the school at 37 Hastings Street in 1924. So I really do want you to like go to this website, type in 37 Hastings Street in the search um, places, and then click that drop up button in the bottom right hand corner um, to select 1924. And I really do want you to put um, your answer in the comments um, so that it's kind of a more interactive presentation. Almost as if we were in person, but not quite, because I can't see you even though you can see me. So let me know when somebody finds the answer to this. This is not a name that I was familiar with before. Although what's interesting about this school to me is that it had a previous name. If anybody can find that, let me know. Um, it had a previous name uh, that a nearby school actually took. So I think they that school moved and I don't know, some, something happened where the schools switched names. <laughs> and um, I'm not exactly sure why. So if anybody has a good history of the public schools in West Roxbury, I would love to hear about it. You can also type that in the chat. And I'll give you guys a couple seconds. So you're looking for uh, 37 Hastings Street in 1924. So you're gonna click that middle button, um, search places, type in 37 Hastings Street, select the right one. And then in the bottom right hand corner, hit the drop up and select 1924. We have a winner. So Richard Olney School is what it was called. Um, so you can see it. Thank you, Teresa. Um, you can see it on the left here. Um, it's got its label here. You can see that this is 1924. Um, and then I found a really cute picture of it where you can really see that it, it is this shape. So that's something that I think is incredibly cool is the detail that people have gone to on these maps um, to reproduce exactly the footprints of the buildings. So um, you can really see like the same structural shape here and here. So I really like that. Thank you guys for participating. There is going to be a little um, section at the end where I'm going to look up places that you guys want to, that you're curious about. So your homes, whatever, um, your relatives, uh, old homes that we can look up. So keep that, keep your gears moving for that. But for now, we're going to be exploring West Roxbury. So 
Um, West Roxbury at the time that these maps started being made um, was a lot bigger than the West Roxbury we know now. Oh, the blue dot signifies um, the place that I looked up. So um, when I searched 37, um, that's where it dropped me. Um, and somebody else asked, how do you see the street number? So the street numbers are, um, this, might be, ooh, this might be kind of hard to see, but they're on this like little blue strip here. Um, so this one is 39. The Richard Oldie School actually doesn't say 37 in front of it on this map. I don't know why, but that is the address, the modern address. That's one other thing to think about is that all you can look up is modern addresses. You can't look up old addresses. Um, so we'll get to that a little bit later. I have a really good example of that, um, but it does make things a little bit more complicated. So West Roxbury was a lot bigger um, than we're used to it being today. Um, it started as, as part of Roxbury, and then at the moment that we're kind of coming into this history, um, there, West Roxbury includes um, Jamaica Plain and Roslindale, but it's no longer a part of Roxbury. Um, so it's kind of this big, maybe shoe-shaped place. Um, and this map that I'm looking at is from 1873. I really love these like title uh, titles on these maps like this. Um, the typography is so beautiful. So um, in the 1880s and 90s, there was a West Roxbury Free Library that was separate from the BPL um, in actually the same location. So you'll see that from 1890, um, when it was right here, it was kind of this rectangular wooden building. Yellow uh, signifies wood and pink usually means brick. Um, so here's this wooden building that was the library from, I believe, 1880 to 1922. Um, oops. Uh, and here I've shown you the this zoomed in version of the sign out front that says Boston Public Library, West Roxbury Branch. So this is actually after the West Roxbury, after the um, free library shuts down at some point in in the 1880s or 90s, um, they give their collection to the West Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library. Or, well, they give their collection to the BPL and then that founds a West Roxbury branch. So I assume that happens around the time that West Roxbury becomes a part of Boston. Um, then in 1922-23, um, this new public library building that you can see is um, now brick because it's pink gets built um, in the same location. Um, this is what it looked like back then. It looks pretty similar today. Um, there's definitely been some kind of remodeling um, and there's been a huge addition because this church that was here on the corner burned down in 1972, I believe. Um, some kind of historic sites of West Roxbury. Um, this is the William, Captain William Draper house. This is a photograph that I got from Digital Commonwealth, which is also like a very good um, place to be looking if you're looking for historic uh, ephemera, maps, all of our maps are stored there. Digital Commonwealth is basically just a, a compendium of um, collections pages smushed together. So collections pages from museums and libraries and archives from all over Massachusetts, including ours um, and including the BPLs. So I definitely recommend checking out, checking out Digital Commonwealth. That's where most of the images that I'm showing tonight are from. Here's a slightly newer picture from, that one was from around the turn of the century. This is from um, 1920. Um, a picture of this 18th century or sorry, 17th century house. Um, and it was actually still owned, if you go to Atlas Scope, by uh, William Draper's um, descendants, the one who owned it in 1874, 100 years after uh, Draper, uh, is actually also named William, but William Willard. 
apparently, um, according to the research that I did, this guy um, and his wife moved out west um, to California during the gold rush and were disappointed and came back. Um, and then they, I believe, died in the 1890s. Um, a really big part of uh, West Roxbury history is this kind of transcendentalist history, um, especially of Brook Farm. Um, this, these maps that we have start in 1874. So that is um, after Brook Farm uh, has kind of fallen apart, is a utopian community, um, kind of an experimental community for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm definitely not an expert, by the way, in West Roxbury history or any Boston history. Um, I'm just a map center employee who has spent a lot of time looking at these maps. <laughs> so um, if anybody has any corrections for me or additional information, feel free to give them in the comments. Um, but basically, after, um, after Brook Farm closed, this land was purchased by a Lutheran organization um, as an orphan orphanage. Um, so this is called Martin Luther Orphan's Home. The building is way up here. So most of this is kind of empty land. Um, and then by 1924, the Lutheran's home, Lutheran home is still here. Um, I've maximized this little uh, inset of it. But a lot of the land is actually taken up by cemeteries, local cemeteries. Um, and I've found the, um, the kind of cemetery history of West Roxbury very interesting. I spent a bunch of time this week looking at just like kind of panning around the cemeteries of West Roxbury. Um, one thing that I found particularly interesting, because it it does tell us about not necessarily the community of uh, of the neighborhood, but the community of the city in general, um, is that there's like a huge burst of Jewish cemeteries that happen. There actually are some here um, where I previously showed you on Brook Farm property, um, but then this is what I found really. Um, really interesting is that from 1874 there are you can see there's a catholic cemetery here and then private land in 1884 there's a jewish cemetery here and then in 1890 there's the sons of benjamin jewish cemetery and tifarath israel jewish cemetery This becomes a kind of huge swath of Jewish cemeteries by 1896 with Out of Israel um, Jewish Cemetery. There are several community Jewish cemeteries here. They're not all uh, attached to congregations exactly. Um, they're connected to like fraternities of sorts. Um, and then just kind of across the street here, there are a bunch of other ones, including United Hand in Hand Association. This is the one that I found the most information on. The um, Boston Hand in Hand Association was a fraternal beneficiary organization established in 1875 by workers in the Boston cigar making industry. So I thought um, that was, I don't know, a lot of detail to, to, uh, to be, available online. Um, these are Sephardic Jews from Holland who immigrated to Boston by way of England. So a lot of these groups are kind of um, like immigrant mutual aid societies, uh, other kinds of things like that. Thanks, Nancy. So here's a, a view that I found on um, Digital Commonwealth that's actually in the Boston City Archives that is uh, very useful for us to kind of like turn these maps into three-dimensional objects and kind of understand them a little bit better. Um, there's this little house right here and there's the, the uh, elevated rail coming down the street. 
And this was labeled as the corner of Spring and Center Streets. So you can actually see this building right here on the map, um, just south of the blue dot. And I zoomed in on this uh, just to show you guys what it actually, what the picture actually looks like, because it's kind of hard to see in that like tiny image. It's probably still pretty small on your screen. Um, but right here is the, it says Roslindale at the top of this train car and then elevated via Forest Hills. And then there's this guy just standing behind this cart full of hay. Uh, you kind of have to imagine that these are the feet of a horse um, leading the, the cart away. And before this, there had actually been only, um, only horse-drawn trains. So these trains are actually newly not drawn by horses in this time period. And this really is Spring and Center Street. I zoomed in all the way on the, film is really amazing, isn't it? Um, zoomed in all the way on the street signs. So I wanted to uh, take a moment to kind of show you um, a uh, like kind of rabbit hole, research rabbit hole that I fell down. Um, this is a business card that I found on Digital Commonwealth that's owned by Historic New England. Uh, for a tutoring service, your home or mine, elementary and junior high subjects, experienced. So this Mrs. Huey lives at 86 Swallow Street in West Roxbury. And as people who actually live in West Roxbury might know that I don't know, um, there is no Swallow Street in West Roxbury. There's one in South Boston, uh, and there's one um, in Newton Lower Falls. Oh, thanks for the correction. Yeah, it's a streetcar, not a train. Um, but yeah, kind of a precursor to the trains. West Roxbury. Um, so basically what I did, sorry, I'm kind of off track. Um, so Swallow Street doesn't exist in West Roxbury, but it must have at some point. Otherwise, this woman would not have put it on her business card because I'm assuming she did know her own address. Uh, so what I did instead was I just went to West Roxbury, um, clicked on the result, and then chose the most recent map to look at. So I chose 1924. Then I clicked about this map like I showed you earlier, um, clicked view list of plates and digital collections, and um, that just shows you this one result back in the past uh, before we kind of compiled our atlases together. This would have taken you to a whole list of, of options that you would have had to navigate, but now it just takes you to one option. Click on that and then click read online. And then the first page you can kind of see here, the first page here is the street index. So I found Swallow Street. It's on plate 26. I went to play 26, and then um, if you zoom in on here, you can see that Swallow Street becomes uh, Searle Street. So somebody fixed this at some point after 1924. I'm not sure exactly what year this happened. I would be interested to know, um, but I didn't quite have time to, to dive into the government documents to find out what year that happened. Um, what I noticed is that this particular Alice has a lot of marking up. So people have crossed stuff out um, and, and really you can kind of see here all of the red on this map is like new street names, um, edited street areas, some streets that are brand new, a brand new golf course. Um, and this is something that would happen all the time. So uh, not only on, like, it's it's not surprising that it happens on our most recent at atlas because basically what people would do is they wouldn't print an atlas every year. Um, after printing one, um, which took a lot of resources, you can imagine, like, how hard it would be to send a person to, like, survey all of this area and uh, draw little footprints of all the buildings. Um, so basically what would happen would be that they would uh, they would just have people fix 
new things that changed on the atlases instead of actually uh, sending out a whole new one. So there are definitely places where people have like printed in the book, but there are also places where people um, like actually get stickers sent from the manufacturer that are called paste-ons to fix little areas that are that have changed or that are incorrect. So basically, I found that Swallow Street doesn't exist anymore and that it is Searle Street. So these are the same, but I don't see here here at 86. Um, this is 78 up here, so it should be on this side of the road in this block, and it is not. So she probably didn't um, own her own uh, house, which is pretty common back then, and it is today as well. So I found her on Ancestry. Um, I looked up Huey at 86 uh, Searle Street, and here she is right here, Edith Huey, head of household. She's a uh, white woman, she's 45 years old, and she has a 14-year-old son named Harry. Um, this is from 1940. And she is still a tutor. So up here, um, this is her, her um, livelihood. Um, it also said that she had lived in the same place in 1935. So she lived there for at least um, at least five years from 1935 to 1940. And if we could figure out the earliest point at which she lived there, um, it would actually help us figure out what year the street names changed. Um, but the way that it is, this atlas helped me find her. So without this, this is kind of the missing link that shows me um, what the street names became, which is very useful. And then we just have, um, this is uh, Theodore Parker's favorite oak, um, which <laughs> I thought was a really great uh, West Roxbury um, foundational image. It's um, going by the, the history of transcendentalism in West Roxbury, Theodore Parker was a, a really big influence. Um, there are throughout digital comments, Commonwealth um, pictures of his house, pictures of his church, and here's his favorite tree. So um, I thought that would be a good place to switch gears and we could talk about Atlas Scope a little bit more and what everyone wants to look up. So if anyone wants to drop an address in here that they want us to look up together, um, kind of uh, look into what the history of certain places were, um, I'd be really happy to do that. So just drop it in the comments while I find my new share screen to share. Okay, so I have so many tabs. Okay, so we can start at Nancy. We can start at 57 Mount Vernon Street. Oops. That was the first one that I saw. In, oh, they almost tricked me. West Roxbury is the last one there. Um, so, it looks like I'm going to compare this to modern aerial imagery just to get a good look. 57 on Vernon Street. Um, let's look a little bit later. It's 54? Okay. Um, we can look at 54. So it's Silas C. Stone's house in 1899. Um, in 1890, it is as well. Um, so that looks like the same. No, not the same building. Okay. So the building is kind of this like T shape um, in 1874 and in 1882, but it had uh, it had um, some stables behind it before. Um, SC Stone gets ownership of it and then maintains that ownership for quite a few years and seems to like build a whole new house, um, which is a wood house. 
and then eventually it belongs to Francis B. Hinckley. This is what I wanted to show you guys how um, how marked up this this version is, the 1924 atlas. Um, let's look at. Oh, I see. Someone wanted 54 and someone wanted 57, and you're on different platforms, so you didn't see each other's um, comments. So 57, I'll still do. H&E Spinney, own it in 1924. Before that, Florence Peck. That's a really great shape for a house. And John Tenney, who was either Tenney or Kenny. One of these is spelled wrong, I'm going to guess, because I bet that the same house wasn't owned by a John Tenney and a John Kenny. Okay, so the first year that this house appears is 1890. So that's kind of cool to know. Um, let's look at Tom's request, 26 Keith Street. All right, so there is nothing there in 1874. There actually is not even a Keith Street there in 1874. Um, not in 1884 either. Here it is in 1896. So let's zoom in. Make this bigger also. Oh, no, that makes it. Okay. Um, 1899. 18, okay, so 1905, it's owned by an Alphonse Nachnik. And 1905, he's still there, but there doesn't seem to be a house on the property. Um, so that's kind of interesting, you know, that your house was not built by 1924. Um, 235 Center Street. Is, is there one in West Roxbury? Okay. Um, I don't know if there is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 33 Stratford Street, let's go there. All right, so again, we see there isn't even a Stratford Street there um, at a certain point. Oh, okay, Josephine, I see that. I'll get to you in a sec. <laughs> um, there isn't even a Stratford Street there in 1874. Let's try jumping ahead a little bit. So this 1896 map is also very marked up. So someone named William B. Blakemore owns this whole section of land in 1896. Um, in 1899, it gets parceled up, and G.W. Spencer owns that particular piece of land. But there's no building on it until 1905 um, when Florence B. Condi owns it. So is this, this is um, interesting to note that 33, what we've looked up as 33 Stratford Street is 56 Stratford Street in the past. So I wonder... So by the time we get to 1924, the modern street addresses are there, and it's 33 again, um, just like it is today. But if we go back a little bit to 1905, the addresses are completely different. So that's kind of uh, <laughs> kind of annoying, but just something that you have to pay attention to. So Josephine, um, you wanted 22235 Center Street. Got it. Okay, so um, nothing there in 1874. It's um, just a property owned by B.B. Hamblin and Barker, um, which is a great name. Um, their heirs, the HRS stands for heirs. So whenever you see that, um, that's what that means kind of uh, parceled off 
belongs to James J. Costello and Elmira A. Young in 1899. Uh, the whole property is owned by the same person again later. And then um, it belongs to the Costellos. Wow, this is pretty interesting. You can really see in the 10 years between 1914 and 1924, an immense amount of development happens here and division of property lines. So the the first person that we know of who owns this little parcel of land is S.A. Kelly. Um, and we can see that there is a house there today, which is I'm sure why you're asking about this, um, but it wasn't built by 1924. Okay, let's check out. Um, let's check out 91 Anna 1 Ave and then we'll head to Bellevue Hill. Okay, so what's interesting here is that there is a building next door in 1874. Um, so unlike the places that we've been looking at, um, there, there actually is already some development here and these property lines have been divided up already. Um, Josephine says Acadia Road is now Acacia Road. I agree that that's strange, but I would also not put it past somebody to have just gotten it wrong um, at some point, um, maybe on these maps. Um, we don't have maps after 1924 for West Roxbury. I'm not sure why um, 1924 is our most recent one, but I can tell you that we don't have any since 1938 because um, after anything after 1938 is still within copyright. Okay, so this uh, land right here that we're looking at, 91 Anawan Ave, um, was owned by M.K. Booth um, in 1896. Um, and the Stevens is in 1890 and 1884. So that's kind of interesting that there was a house here, it gets knocked down or burned down, the house next door, the property next door is the one that gets developed. So it'd be interesting to find out if this is your house um, or if this is just a, a very similar but printed house. Um, and that's something that you can probably find out by looking in the town records. Um, Let's talk about Bellevue Hill. Um, one of the things that I actually forgot to put in here, but meant to, um, is that is the uh, the kind of development of the um, the water tower area, uh, which there are some good pictures of the water tower over the years. Um, in Digital Commonwealth that I suggest that you look up. So let's look at this area. So there, are, it's definitely populated in the 1870s and 80s. Um, it's a fair amount of people, but there's still a lot of property that's completely undeveloped. So it's like parceled off and owned um, and labeled, but not developed. And then as we move through the years, Um, that definitely becomes less of an issue. There are more and more homes here. And they're almost all wood, which is not surprising for the time period. And then, <laughs> and then this thing happens after 1924 that I am very curious about, which is, um, the addition of all these roads and the changing of many of their names. So if anybody has any insight into that, would love it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of Bellevue Hill. Um, there's a this school taking, I really like <laughs> um, that notation, which is pretty common um, throughout these maps. 
And what else do you want to show you here? So all the way up on Bellevue Hill, there's this water tower. It really is shaped like that. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it for you. Next time. <laughs> um, but this road also, Bellevue Hill Road, um, gets developed in that time period. So before that, it was um, this like kind of park that just turned into more park. Um, oops. And it had just started as this little little park here, um, and then land that people owned. Um, and then I guess the city must have bought it at some point. Probably because of West Roxbury Parkway. Okay. Um, let's look at the north end of Mount Vernon Street and see how it evolved over time. Let's choose the right now, Vernon Street. Um, so this is the south end of it here, um, which we've taken a pretty good look at already. And the farthest it goes north is, yep, okay, still true. There is a lot less development here than at the south end of it, as I'm sure this person already knew um, before they asked. Um, something that I think is kind of interesting as we go through this is there's this, I know this is the south end of it, but Mount Vernon School, um, which is clearly named after the street, but then it actually becomes the Robert G. Shaw School as opposed to the where was it? The only school over here, which had actually been the Robert G. Shaw School before that. So that's what I thought was kind of weird before. Um, but yeah, Mount Vernon Street does become pretty populated by the turn of the century, I would say. Um, looks like that's about the time that it really picks up the pace. Let's look at 12 Cypress. I'm assuming that's Cypress Street. Um, so here in um, 1874, the buildings are not numbered, which is not super helpful. Um, I think we're gonna have another one of those situations where the <laughs> addresses change over time because it looks like it goes eight, nine, 10 here. Um, but this building uh, is eerily similar to the building that's there today owned by uh, Joseph Plumer in 1884. The Owenses in 1890. And they just keep owning it um, through 1924. So that's pretty interesting. And they have a stable or a barn or something at the um, at the back. And it is 12 by that point. Cool, yeah. So again, the addresses do change over the years. Um, and you kind of have to watch that. Okay. Um, 2222 Center Street. Oops, that's Brooklyn. And that's why <laughs> you click on it instead of hitting enter. Okay. Um, so, owned by Joseph Billings uh, at the earliest date, 1874. There's no house there in 1890 or 1899. Oh, yes. Good question, Nancy. The number um, written under the name is usually square footage of the property. Um, I can show you guys an example. So, yeah, so like this 6119 probably is the square footage. 
um, these huge square footage numbers um, as well in the hundreds of thousands on the bigger pieces of property. 1914 and then 1924. So it does look like the the German Ladies Aid Society of Boston owns this property in 1924. They do have some kind of building here. Um, I think that's something that um, I've noticed a lot is these uh, Ladies Aid Societies owning large amounts of property in the city. Um, oh, it's the nursing home? Yeah. Um, so this is, um, the, the nursing home today, and at the time, it was owned by the um, the German Lady Aid Society. There's a lot of um, there's like a Syrian and Lebanese Ladies Aid Society uh, downtown. There's um, there's a lot of these. Let's look at 111 Vermont Street for Elizabeth. Interesting. Okay, so we can compare to a modern street map to make sure I'm in the right place. So back then, Mount Vernon Street was uh, the whole like L here. So this whole thing was Mount Vernon Street, not Vermont. And that changes by 1924. So let's look at this property owned by B.S. McGinnis um, by 1924, but no, no building on it. And let's check out Rustic Road for Mike. Might as well. All right, so <laughs> unsurprisingly, no Rustic Road in 1874. Um, it looks like a road is being proposed. You can see it cutting through here with the dotted lines in 1896. Um, still proposed 1899. And then, okay, so sometime between, um, 1914 and 1924 this road gets built um, or maybe shortly after it's kind of hard to tell because this has been crossed out and written all over i think it happens okay yeah it's happened sometimes after 1924. so rustic road it turns out not all that rustic is it um pretty pretty new Let's check out 31 List Street. Was it a speakeasy or dance hall? So that is in Rosendale, you mean, Beth? Um, so the latest that we can go is 1924. Um, when, at which time there is no building there, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, yeah, I guess it's technically in Roslindale, but it might as well. It's just right there. Um, so part of the problem that you can find uh, with Atlas Scope that, that definitely is like uh, an issue is that these atlases themselves are privileging the information of property ownership over um, whoever lived there. So we don't actually get the information who lived in this house necessarily, we get the information who owned this building or who owned this property. So I definitely recommend using this in conjunction with something. Um, oh, do you think it's this building right here? Maybe. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I definitely recommend using this in conjunction with something else like um, the like Ancestry. Right now, Boston Public Library is offering um, Ancestry Library Edition at home. So you can use it just from your house um, by going to the library website and going to their resources. So I definitely recommend doing that. That's how, that's the only way that I found um, Mrs. Huey. Um, that it wouldn't have been possible to find her just using Aliscope uh, because she didn't own her home. So there's uh, a lot of complicated like class and race um, histories that are not accessible through Aliscope. <clears throat> But I definitely still think it, it works really well as a tool for filling in missing information and bridging gaps um, between things that you already know and things that you uh, you need to know to to look up further, do further research. So that's what I use it for. Um, and I also just use it to kind of pan around um, and look for um, interesting things. So. I definitely recommend checking this out. I also have to recommend that you fill out our feedback form, which I will put in the chat. Um, telling me not to say um is probably not a very useful um, piece of information to give me, but thank you anyway. Oh, I didn't. Post to Facebook. And uh, yeah, Nancy actually has a really good, oops, not that. <laughs> Nancy has a really good piece of information, which is looking at city directories. Um, if you have trouble finding city directories, I there are a bunch that on websites that I usually use. Um, but you can also just, like, a lot of them are available on Google Books for free. Um, so I definitely recommend that. City directories in conjunction with Atlascope and, um, like, advertisements from the time for uh, for dance halls and stuff like that would definitely be kind of a good, useful uh, conjunction of, um, of pieces of, of resource to put together. So please fill out that feedback form. Let me know um, what I can do better and uh, what you would like to see on another installation of this. We were going to do this in person before the pandemic. Unfortunately, um, that didn't happen. But hopefully, we will be able to do it in person again soon. I would love to come to the West Roxbury branch um, and meet you all <laughs> instead of having to do this like weird uh, Facebook and YouTube comment dance with you all. Um, but thank you for being engaged and for um, being here. If you are super interested in maps um, in general and maps of Boston specifically, you should definitely join um, the Boston Map Society. Um, I highly recommend it. It's a, a group of um, map nerds who would love to have you. Um, so membership is actually free this year because of coronavirus. Um, you're not paying for like wine and cheese events. So uh, membership is free this year. You can check out the programming, see if you like it, <laughs> decide whether you wanna pay for next year. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the program tonight. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna sign off now and have a good night. Fill out the feedback form.